So here's a couple of slides on color images. First off, there is no such thing as a color image. There never has been such thing as a color image. What it really is is a combination of color planes. All color images are made up of at least three, sometimes four, separate images collected separately at different colors. So old-fashioned photographs, the original ones had just one color and they were black and white. Color photographs had three, a stack of three emulsions, one that was sensitive to red light, one that was sensitive to green light, and one that was sensitive to blue light. And so a color negative is actually a stack of three emulsions, red, green, and blue. Digital cameras or your HDTV actually has three sets of pixels. There's a red pixel array, there's a green pixel array, and a blue pixel array. And the computer changes the levels of brightness of each of those three sets of pixels in order to make a three color image. For some digital images, you can, instead of having RGB, red, green, blue planes, you can sometimes have something called CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and key, which corresponds to black. So I'm not going to talk any more about CMYK images here, but I just wanted to uh, let you know that sometimes you can have a four color, four plane color image in addition to the three plane color images we're going to be talking about here. So uh, in email, I have heard people talk about colorized images. When colloquially, when you say colorized, usually what that means is take a black and white photo and assign colors to the shades of gray. So here's an example of that. Here we've got a picture, a real picture of Abraham Lincoln and an artist has taken those shades of black and white and translated them to color but that artist is making a judgment call. They have taken one black and white photo and superimposed three colors on it. So they're making judgments here. They've removed a lot of the dust and, and grit in the image, you can see that, but they're also making judgments. Like from that black and white image, can you tell if his tie is red or green? You probably can't. And so the artist made a judgment and said, okay, that shade of gray, I'm gonna color red. So astronomical images at the end of the day are really no different than any other image. Remember our discussion of filters? Well, this is one of the slides from that. And you can take images in any of a wide variety of filters. And those different filters mean that the image only includes light from a certain range of wavelengths, like a B-band filter is only going to include a relatively narrow of range of blue light. So you take an image in one filter and you assign colors to that image from that filter. And you do that as many times as you want or need to. And you can assign shades of color any way you want. So it's really sort of a color by number game. So let's imagine that we have an image where the values, the because remember uh, any kind of digital image from your camera, um, on your TV screen, or with an astronomical image, at the end of the day it comes back to ones and zeros. So um, we're going to say color by number, we're going to say that our image has a range of values between zero and eight. And I am going to do a color by number where all of the ones are purple, all the twos are blue, and so on, up to the eights being red. So within that image, I'm going to assign each one of these numbers to a color. But what if my image has values more than eight? Well, I can change how I'm mapping those colors. I can color all the zeros and ones black, all the twos and threes purple, and so on, all the sixteens and seventeens are red. So now I can show data over a much larger range. I can show data between 0 and 17, not just between 0 and 8. But what if the values in my image are not integers? What color should I make 7.9, for example? Well, I can change that mapping of numbers to colors and make it not discrete but continuous. So now I have a more continuous spectrum of colors to map the more continuous range of numbers that I have. But what if I have numbers in this image much larger than 17? Well, I can do a much different kind of mapping. I can say, all right, if the number 
and my image is between 0 and 9, I'll color it this, you know, sort of magenta color. If it's between 10 and 99, it's blue. Between 100 and 999, it's, it's that shade of blue. Well, remember your scientific notation. So I can display this as 10 to the 0, be between 10 to the 0 and 10 to the 1. That's between 1 and 10. 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, between 10 and 100, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, and so on. So now I can display a much larger range of numbers than I could before because I'm going from 10 to the 0 to 10 to the 12. So that's a huge range of numbers. But at the end of the day, I'm still just working with one image here. I can use any color table I want. So the term color table describes the range of colors to which I'm mapping the data val values from one image. So the examples we just gave are the two top ones. But look, there's a huge variety of other color tables you can pick. And any tool that you have that displays fits images is also going to have a huge range of color tables you can pick from. This is the range of choices from DS9, for example. There's a lot of different um, names here where they're talking about the different names of the different color tables and then you can invert them and you can you know change you can do a user you can define your own uh, color table but at the end of the day that's describing the range of colors to which you're assigning the numbers now what are typical ranges of values that you find in images well if you have a jpeg or, or gif it's typically eight bits deep which means that there's two to the eight possible values per pixel per color plane in the image. So 2 to the 8 is only 256. But astronomical images, FITS images, are often 2 to the 16 or 2 to the 32 values per pixel. So that's a much larger range of numbers than you have to display in a JPEG or a GIF. And it's even much more than you can really take in with just your eyes. So how you map that huge range of numbers to the colors is a choice that you make depending on what details you want to bring out in the image. So the term for that is color stretch. It describes how you translate the range of data values to the range of colors, again, from just one image. And so those are the three color stretches we were working with earlier. But there's a huge variety of color stretches you can make in any tool that has uh, fits imaging capability. So this is the options from DS9, and you can do a linear thing like the 0 to 8, or you can do a logarithmic uh, scale like the 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, up to 10 to 11, 10 to the 12. You can also do power square roots, you know, all sorts of different choices here. I encourage you to play around with it, but at the end of the day, this is describing how you translate the range of numbers to the range of colors. And so you can you can use different scalings. You can also use different ranges of numbers. You can only use the the range of, of numbers that represent 96% of the pixels, for example, or you can define your own range. If you're only interested in a narrow range of colors, uh, of values, you can map the whole range of colors to a narrow range of values. So when you have a single astronomical image in when you're doing science uh, in papers or in posters for doing research for doing science it's often shown in just grayscale or reverse grayscale that is really the least distracting way to display the details in the image sometimes it's useful to use those color tables but you know at the end of the day when you get down to business it's usually grayscale but what if we took just one of those images and rather than scaling it uh, to shade, scaling the values to ranges of black to white. What if we did that one image on scales of black to red? And another image black to green? And another image black to blue? When you stack them all up, that's how you, or your TV, or your digital camera, constructs a three-color image is by making one image per color plane, where one image is between black and red, one image is between black and green, one image is between black and blue. So Finder Chart will do this for you really quickly and easily. There's a button you hit, it says make three color images, and it gives you one. You, you can hit other buttons to see exactly what it's used. In this case, it's using Ys3 for the red band, Ys2 for the green band, and Ys1 for the blue band, but you can change that. You can change it to be something different. DS9 also does it, has a little bit different interface, but it's the same idea. You pick different channels for red, green, and blue. In this case, this is JH and K2 mass data. So when you construct an image this way, if you have something that ends up being white in the image, it's bright in all three bands, and black is faint in all three bands. Conventionally, 
when you're doing astronomical images, you want the red plane to be the longest wavelength you use and the blue plane to be the shortest wavelength you use. But you can do whatever you want. When you do the finder chart, it comes up by default using red for 12 microns, green for 4.5 microns, and blue for 3.5 microns. That's the way that it comes up by default, but you can change it. So DS9 does the same thing. Here I've got blue is the J, the blue plane is the J band, green is the H band, and red is the K band. But you can stack them up however you want. I mean, here I've done red is Y is 4 at 22 microns, green is 2 mass H at 1.6 microns, and blue is DSS red. This ends up with a really hideous looking image, but it still has something to teach us. Look, there's hugely different spatial resolutions here. We've got one blob that encompasses two sources. And look, there's a lot of sources that are bright just to green, a lot of sources that are bright just to blue, and a lot of sources that are bright just as red. Remember I said if it's bright at all three bands, it'll be white, but there's really nothing white here. So this is really telling us something interesting about this image. So even if you create a garish looking image, there's still things that you can learn from the image. Now, for true color, you often see public images that, you know, that describe things as true color. Occasionally you'll see the term false color. What do you mean by true color? That is a super complicated question. And there's a lot of people who have taken their time to address that in more detail. And it's a really fascinating issue. And the bottom line is that there's really no good definition for true color. The term false color makes it seem like we're hiding something, but your eyes, for example, don't see infrared or x-rays. So if I made a quote, true color IR image, it would be black, which is completely useless. So rather than saying false color, representative color is a better term to use. There's lots and lots of links on the wiki on this. There's lots of um, people who've done a lot of careful thinking about this and written up a lot of good stuff. So I encourage you to go take a look at the wiki.